Last week on Mystery Monday, we spoke about the legends of King Solomon and whether King Solomon was actually a wise, true, and good king or a satanic tyrant. Well, this week on Mystery Monday, we're going to go into his grimoire, his own personal spell books. Are these spell books that are notoriously for evil or are these spell books that are possibly for good. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we absolutely would not be able to do what we do. So you are all much, much, much appreciated and much, much, much loved. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about the Key of Solomon and the Lesser Key of Solomon. Now, this information that we're going to be talking about today deserves so much more than just one episode. With that being said, I am dropping this episode a couple of hours earlier than I typically drop episodes because at 10 o'clock this morning, Eastern time, I am going to be on with Mornay and Shanti on Aquarius Rising Africa to also be discussing this work and also be discussing Solomon. As you guys know by now, all the shows that I do with Shanti and Mornay over on Aquarius Rising Africa are all live shows. So that allows you the opportunity to to interact with the program as well. Now on those shows, I don't, I'm not able to see the comments, but Mornay is always moderating the con comments. And so if there's something that you know about these books that I have not found or have not brought up, then please, please, please join us at 10 a.m. Eastern time on Aquarius Rising Africa so you can add that into the live chat so we can discuss it. I also was originally planning on doing this episode with Stephanie so we could pull some cards on this book. But as you guys know, Stephanie's been a little bit under the weather. And so when she is feeling better, we will have her back on the show to look at this book, just like we did with her with the Necronomicon. With that being said, if you have contacted Stephanie regarding a uh, personal reading, just be a little bit patient. As you guys know, again, she is under the weather right now. And so she needs to get her rest up so that her channeling can be clear when she comes back on and back to her channel, back to my channel and back to her personal reading. So please just be very, very patient as she works through her own sickness. We're all just human beings. And so sometimes we all just need some time to allow our body to heal and do the kick-ass job that Stephanie always delivers. Now, again, for those who have been on the channel for a long time, I did post on Twitter that Tuesdays we are tomorrow. We are going to be, we're still going to be going through the Magdalene manuscript, but on Wednesdays, we're going to start to go over the uh, Sophia code. I was planning on covering the Sophia code after I was finished with the Magdalene manuscript, but I'm being urged by spirit right now to go ahead and do them at the same time. So on Wednesdays, we will be doing the Sophia Code. I will place a link to this book down in the description box below. If you wanna purchase the book to be able to move through the material with us, it's not necessary though. If money is tight for you, I totally understand. If it's not in the budget right now to buy the book, it's no big deal because you can just listen. I'm gonna be reading aloud and doing commentary on it so you, can get enough just from listening to us talk about it. And then once we get through this book, we're going to bring Cindy back on the show because she is kind of an expert on this stuff. And this will be going under the Magdalene series, the playlist on my channel, uh, because this does connect to Mary Magdalene, the priestesshood of Isis, all that kind of stuff with the divine feminine. So it will be under the same playlist, which again, 
I rarely go live on this channel. It's too hard for me to go live because I get too distracted by all the comments. So most of my videos are always going to be cataloged on this channel for you to go back and re-listen to. I've even kept up videos that I now totally disagree with that I did a couple of years ago. Those are still up on my channel. So you always have access to all of the work. The only time videos are removed is if YouTube removes them. All right, let's get into the Key of Solomon and the Lesser Key of Solomon. Now, if you missed last week's Monday Mystery where we talked about Solomon, I would suggest that you go back and listen to that first. I don't really want to get back into all of his interesting um, legends and theories regarding his ring. There's just some interesting stuff there regarding Regarding his controlling of demons that could inform how we interpret these two books. So once again, that episode will be down in the description box below. If you missed that, I would suggest pausing this episode, watching that first, and then coming back to this one. So with the key of Solomon and the lesser key of Solomon, there are a lot of legends regarding how these books came into existence. Now, once again, I don't know if King Solomon actually existed or not. I'm up in the air with that. The reason being is that we know a lot of our history has been made up and manipulated, timelines manipulated. We know the Roman Empire allegedly did not ever exist. Uh, the Dark Ages are called that because that's where they added in a lot of years that just frankly didn't happen. So we're just going to talk about a bit of the legend revol revolving around Solomon's input into this book, these two books, as it is right now. Again, who knows whether it's true or not. So the legend states that Solomon wrote these two books for his son, Rhea Bowen. And Rhea Bowen was definitely a very interesting biblical character. He himself had 18 wives, 60 concubines, which we spoke about last week, which in my opinion is definitely. Rhea Bowen became the king of Israel at the age of 41. And he is the king that split Israel into two different territories. So by the end of his reign, he was the king of Judah, which was the lower state of Israel. Now this happened because there was this fella named Jeroboam who had been exiled into Egypt during King Solomon's reign because he believed in such things as low taxes and fair wages for work. Oh, and also he asked for things like fair labor laws. Now, Jeroboam probably is cast as the bad guy in the big biblical narrative, whereas Solomon was the good guy. But for any of us watching right now, I kind of take Jeroboam's side. I want less taxes. I want fair labor laws and fair wages. And we know that King Solomon's wealth, as we spoke about last week, came from him overtaxing his people, overworking his people. And so once Solomon passed away, Jeroboam was able to come back and plead with the son, Rehoboam, to reconsider some ethical laws regarding the people of Israel. And this is what caused the split. This is what caused a lot of the tribes to revolt and to leave the kingdom, to move into their own territory, was because they wanted fairness. And it is definitely under my assumption, given some of the evidence we see in Solomon's reign, not only with his seal, but with the way that he collected his money, that there are some psychopathic reasoning behind this family. And we're seeing the same thing with Rhea Bowen as well, his son. Is King Solomon a bloodline family? I have no idea. Like I said, I don't even know if he actually really existed or if this was just a story, a propaganda-based story to manipulate where we sit now in our timeline. But regardless, it's extremely sketchy. So let's first talk about the uh, Key of Solomon. So this is a book that's, again, called a grimoire. And a grimoire just basically means a spell book. But from my understanding, the Key of Solomon is definitely more of like a preparation for casting spells than the Lesser Key of Solomon, which we're going to get to next. Now, I myself has, have never participated in any type of like ritualized magic ever. I've never done this. So I want to make some things clear, though. When we talk about spell work and we talk about magic, we're talking about a real baseline practice. 
You guys have heard me say a lot that the darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can. And so a lot of these practices that we see coming from the dark arts were once practiced by the light in a more pure way. When things like spell casting, anything that takes away somebody else's free will is definitely negative. This can be something as simple as a love spell. This could be wishing harm to someone. This could be spells to block communication or stuff that I've gone through, um, spells casted on my channel to suppress growth. These are all negatively polar polarized spell casting or AKA black magic. You cannot, that is one of the main rules of the universe is this idea of free will. And with free will, we have this sub law of consent. You have to give consent. This is why um, on my channel, especially, we will not read tarot cards on people that aren't here to give us our consent, regardless of whether they're good or bad, because that's breaking the law of free will. It doesn't matter who you are. If you break that law of free will and you ignore consent, you're practicing a form of black magic. You're practicing a form of negative polarity service to self. And that's something that I'm just not interested in. I don't want to hurt anybody. And I don't want to take anybody else's opportunity to live their own lives and make their own decisions. Now, again, as I've said before, with things like black magic and spell casting, the only thing they can do is mess with your mind. I spoke about this on Cap with Catherine Edwards. The mind, our mind scrambling, our mind control that we see coming through like the media um, is the only thing that can be done is it can confuse the mind. Even in love spells, they just confuse the mind. What they can't touch is the heart because the heart is that direct line to God, to source, and that's the saving grace. And that's usually why a lot of love spells do over time end up backfiring is because the victim, the person who's had the spell cast on them at first is confused by the delusion of the mind, but still has that original feeling in the heart. And over time, this tug of war cognitive dissonance becomes more and more and more evident. Also, the thing about spell casting, especially when it comes to black magic and um, taking away somebody else's free will or consent, is that you constantly have to be upping the ante. You can't just cast one spell and then expect for it to last forever because it wears off. You have to keep doing it in order to keep the person attached to you. And frankly, no one's got time for that. And call me prideful, call me whatever, but I definitely, if, when it comes to love spells, I definitely, if I'm laying next to a man in bed, I want to know that man is there because he wants to be there. Not because I've done anything to manipulate him to be there, but that's just me. All right. So when we get into spell casting, now there are some rituals I have watched some spell casting that I've, I have watched that are not negative. And these are usually just spells for asking for protection, asking for um, guidance, asking for healing. And that's totally fine. Now you have to have the person's permission to ask spirit to heal them, of course. But most of the time in these, these other kind of white magic ceremonies I've watched on YouTube and stuff like that, they're doing it for themselves. They're asking for healing for themselves. And so that in itself is totally, totally, totally fine. And so a lot of the setup for both of these kinds of magic are going to look very, very similar. It's just the action and intention behind them that change the game. So again, the key of Solomon is divided between two different sections or two different books. And they do make it very specific that any power you're generating through these rituals is coming from God or Lucifer for depending on which one you're serving, that there is a higher power that you are connecting with. We talk a lot about the connection to source for those of us that are of the light. That is your gut. Like when you feel your gut speaking to you, you have a gut reaction. That's usually from source, from God. And so obviously you're acknowledging that you are a fragment of that higher being. You are that child. Now with Lucifer's connection, the darkness connection, it's very different because Lucifer doesn't have control over the gut feeling because Lucifer can't create a spark of life. And so we know that for ritualistic purposes, a lot of times for the darkness to give you what you want in life, whether that be power, money, love, whatever, there has to be a sacrifice made in return. 
usually that comes at the expense of another life. You guys know what I'm talking about. And that's because that's what feeds Lucifer because Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call the dark side cannot create their own spark of light. So they're constantly feeding off of others that have the spark of life of divinity. But like in any black magic ceremony, that spark of life, that feeding is only going to last for so long before you have to do another one. This is again where black magic gets really, really dangerous. And frankly, in my opinion, is just not even worth it. And Cindy talks about this a lot, my friend Cindy, that when you practice magic, you are the conduit. And so regardless of whether you're practicing for the light or for the darkness, the darkness or the light have to run through you first. That's why we're seeing a lot of uh, truthers out there who are actually involved in black magic who are infiltrators we're starting to see like their teeth are starting to change their skin is starting to change we're starting to see some eyes shift on their programs and it's because they have to be the conduit of these spells and so it takes a lot out of them as well in order to keep up with this like charade of of illusion in order to get what they want that service to self in the Key of Solomon, there is a specific section that tells you to pay attention to symbolism and astrology. Again, we know that astrology is not bad. It's just the calendar of the galactics. It's a, a tool that's been stripped from mankind that our ancestors definitely used in order to understand where we are in space and time and understand how we are affected by the cosmos, by the planets. In the um, Apocalypse of Abraham, one of the missing books of the Bible, God says that in the fifth firmament lies the stars and the planets and they are messengers. Well, messenger is also the, the word angel means messenger. So take that for what that is, that there is significance to astrology. So in the Key of Solomon, there is a um, basically an outline of how to set up your space in order to create your ritual. And some of this kind of aligns with uh, saucha, which is a Sanskrit word meaning cleanliness. So even for like my yoga practice, I have to maintain in my life cleanliness in order to constantly be pure purifying my mind and my body. So again, this setup is not in itself inherently bad. It just depends on what you're using it for. It's just an outline. Now, this also, this same setup is also in the Lesser Key of Solomon, which we're going to talk about next as well. It's in the Croatia of the Lesser Key of Solomon. So first things first, what I've learned from people who have participated in this is that it could take up to 18 months for you to be physically, mentally, and spiritually prepared to do the spell work in the lesser key of Solomon. This makes sense to me just because I know how much preparation takes in yoga in order for you to start understanding certain um, spiritual impl implications within your, within your own karmic cycle. So the first step is preparation. So you're preparing yourself, you're creating a wand. If you um, want to use a wand, I don't have wands. I've never had a wand. But for the negative side of this, it did make me think of Hollywood, the holly branch. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's also suggested that you get the pentacle that's associated with Solomon. And it's also suggested that you do a reading of the certain amount of Psalms from the Bible, which is a question I do have for Stephanie. Does that mean that Psalms themselves are spells? I don't know. The next step is purifying yourself, uh, going through fasting, going through anything you need to do to make sure that your physical body is in the right space to be able to conduct what you're going to do. Because again, as I said earlier, everything has to channel through you in order for things to come to fruition, whether for the light or the dark. The next step is setting up your temple, your temple formation, um, whether that's an altar. Like I said, I've, I've never done this myself. I don't plan on it. But I do know that even for my own yoga practice, I do have a specific space in my house where I do my practice. It's in the kitchen in front of my dog bowl. But I'm very funny about my particular space because that's where I'm able to focus my mind. Uh, quiet my mind down the most where I'm not as distracted by other things going on in the house. And then you have the worship. So whether you're worshiping source or Lucifer, then conjuration, and then the license to depart. And again, I don't know much about conjuring or license to depart because again, I've never practiced any type of magic ritual on my own. So, but I think those do sound pretty self-explanatory. So in my opinion, the, the key of Solomon isn't as dark or dirty as what we're going to get into with the lesser key of Solomon, because it's literally just a manual on how to do something. And depending on what your intention is and whether you serve the darkness or the light, 
that's what's going to, it's going to be for, right? It's up to the conduit, not the book. Now, before we get into the lesser key of Solomon, something that was very interesting I found in my research is that throughout the ages, apparently, allegedly, a lot of the clergy and the church have studied both the key of Solomon and the lesser key of Solomon and have participated in these rituals that we're going to get into with the lesser key of Solomon. Now, within the lesser key of Solomon, there is actually a word called Solomonic spells, which is really interesting that King Solomon, the good old wise King Solomon actually has Solomonic spells, which make again, makes you shake your head and go, what the hell have we been taught in church all these years? This is one of the most popular books on demonology and is also like the Necronomicon that we spoke about a couple weeks ago, which I will link down below as well. It is considered a book on summoning the dead. There are five different sections in this book. And just as you are summoning the dead, it is also teaching you how to summon the 72 different demons named in this book to do your bidding. Just like Solomon summoned these demons to build his temple as the Freemasons are now looking to build the third temple of Solomon. And I guarantee you they're probably summoning demons too. Just my opinion though. Don't come at me, Freemasons. Now, just like the key of Solomon was allegedly written by Solomon for his son, the lesser key of Solomon is also allegedly written by Solomon for his son. However, many scholars date it back to the 17th century, which makes more sense to me if you're looking at Tartaria. But once again, we really have no idea what our real history is. And so I'm just going to leave that there. Now, this is where things get interesting with the lesser key of Solomon. Not only is there areas to summon demons and the dead do your bidding, but there's also a whole section on how to do curses. Don't do curses, guys. I mean, seriously, don't do curses. What you put out there is going to come back to you. I know that over the past five months, I think there's been at least three death spells that have been put on me, um, which I kind of laugh about because I'm still here. <laughs> um, and all I can say is that it, it just, I don't have to do anything because that's the karmic cycle. What you put out, you get back. It's cause and effect. And so don't do fucking curses, guys. Like, don't be that person. Don't be that person. Be a person of love. Be a person of, of honor and respect and integrity. Don't do curses. It also teaches you how to locate items, which, granted, I have a tendency to lose my keys a lot. So <laughs> I could definitely use help with locating my keys. Um, and I don't live in a very big place, but I do tend to lose my keys. But beyond that, you know, again, what are you summoning to show you where these items are? That's the question. There's also apparently a spell that teaches you how to become invisible, which is interesting. And now here's the thing too, as many a times as a lot of us have probably said, as I've said in my life, man, I'd love to be a, a fly on the wall for that conversation. Or I'd love to like listen in on something. Don't do that guys. Like don't, even if you know how to astro travel, like don't freaking go to somebody's house and spy on them without their permission. Not cool. Not cool guys. Like I don't even look at people's social media that i am skeptical like, that I have issues with. I won't even look at their stuff. Like, just leave it. Like, just freaking leave it. Like, let the universe do what it's going to do. Let divinity do what it's going to do. Don't become invisible so you can, like, spy on someone. Like, again, you need consent. You absolutely need consent. We need court of law. We need law and order. Don't do that. And how would you like it? You know, like, okay, so I joke about how I sleep in oversized t-shirt and granny panties. And in fairness, I have changed that. I have changed that. I did go and buy some uh, sleeping garments that are a little bit more sexy. And I'm actually enjoying it more. I'm actually enjoying sleeping in something that's a little bit more feminine. So I have changed that. But I mean, think about that, guys. Like, how would you like it? Like, let's say like you're not feeling your, your greatest and you're like in the bed and you're like, I don't know, watching Netflix or a movie or something. And somebody's like invisibly standing in your room watching you. I just, I mean, just I, that that's don't do that. Like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Like for real, just treat people the way that you would want to be treated. I know I don't want to be spied on. I don't want to be spied on by the government through my freaking devices. And I definitely don't want to be spied on by other people who can make themselves invisible. Just don't do it, guys. Don't do it.
It also, again, teaches you how to do love potions. Once again, don't do that. Don't do that. How would you like it? Like, how would you like it if somebody did a love spell on you to fall in love with them? I wouldn't like that. I actually think somebody did do um, a love potion on me a few months ago, but uh, because I kind of got a heads up about it, but it didn't work. So (laughs) um, it it didn't work. Um, But how would you like that if somebody took away your ability, your cognitive ability to make your own decisions over who you decide to be intimate with, who you decide to share your life with. Like, that's not cool. Like, don't do that. I just, and maybe, you know, I would rather, I would rather spend the rest of my life alone than have a man be with me because I casted a spell on him. Like, that's gross. That's just freaking gross. And for me, like my most successful relationships have been with men that my my longest term relationships have been with men that I was really good friends with too, where they were my best friend, where I could like, you know, it wasn't just about the intimacy of the the physical world or the physical intimacy. It was also about the fact that we could laugh together and make fun of each other and go in like, do things together and, and really enjoy each other's company outside of, of romance, you know, just in general. And if you're spell casting someone, I just don't see how that's even possible to have that type of, um, of a friendship within the romance too. So I just, I'm begging you guys, please like in our new, new timeline in our, as Jamie Slay says, new earth 2.0, let's just do away with all this nonsense because it's just, it's just gross. And let's just let people be in love with who they're in love with. Yeah. Can we do that? Now, one of the creepiest things about this book to me is that apparently when you have a copy of the lesser key of Solomon, which is why I won't, this is why I definitely will not 100% ever own a copy of this book is that shadow people, shadow creatures come with the book. And I myself am not a stranger to shadow creatures or the hat man. I've covered shadow creatures and the hat man on this channel before many times. I've seen them a lot. They're not fun and they're not associated with good stuff. And so in my opinion, with that being said, when you have this book, a lot like the Necronomicon, I think you're kind of inviting, even if you don't read it, Well, even if you don't read it or you do read it and you don't participate, you just read it just to read it. You're not going to do the spells. I think you're still kind of inviting some some darkness into your life. Again, like the Necronomicon. The Necronomicon, just as we talked about last week, according to uh, testimony, just having the book. And a lot of you reach out to me with your own testimony. I'm going to be contacting some of you to come on a show in the future to talk about it. Just having the book apparently causes issues within your own house, chaos. Apparently, so does this, the lesser key of Solomon. Now, again, with that being said, I'm putting the warning out there. I, uh, as I said, I'm I'm someone that does support 100% free will and consent. And I I do believe that you should not censor anything. So if you want to read the book and you want to own the book, that is totally your prerogative. I just want to make sure that these warnings are out there. All right, guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comment section below. if you're watching this before 10 a.m. on Monday, then join us over on Aquarius Rising Africa as we continue this discussion. After the episode airs on Aquarius Rising Africa, if you missed the live show, I will also share that episode on my community tab so you can go back and listen to that discussion as well. And as soon as Stephanie is feeling better, as I mentioned in the beginning, I will bring her back on and we'll take a deeper look through the cards at what we need to know about King Solomon and these two books attributed to him. All right, guys, I'll talk to you soon.